So, welcome to uh, our session uh, to the sliding back into authoritarianism uh, colloquium that my colleague Suji Chowdhury and I are organizing uh, this semester. So today is a special um, <coughs> session uh, because today, unlike um, the rest uh, of the year, we don't just we don't we haven't just invited one speaker, uh, but we've invited four speakers. Uh, in fact, uh, we've invited a panel uh, to discuss uh, a number of serious issues uh, as they have arisen uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and in particular in Hungary, but not only Hungary. This is about uh, a number of jurisdictions um, in Eastern Europe. And so what we want to have a discussion about on this panel um, is the question of what is actually going on there. We need to get a better idea of what's going on, both explanatorily, what's happening, how do constitutions uh, account for what is happening, how do they come in either as an enabling or restricting force uh, for various political actors, and then what can be done about it. Uh, um, on the European level in particular perhaps, but not only uh, on that level. So those are the kinds of discussions uh, that we'll have and we'll, int we'll start today um, uh, by having each of our uh, panelists just speak very briefly, make an original statement of no more than five to seven minutes and we will hold you to that, we'll enforce that, um, in order to have more time uh, for the discussion that follows. So Sujit and I will only play a, a moderating role. We will not play an, an active contributing role ourselves. We'll just moderate and enable a conversation to take place first among the panelists and then very soon thereafter opening up to the uh, general audience. Now we have with us uh, four, um, uh, perhaps among the four greatest experts um, uh, on this issue. We're very privileged uh, to uh, have this group uh, here today. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing each one of them individually. Most of you will know them quite well um, uh, uh, anyway, but we have here not just distinguished scholars, all of them, um, on the subject matter, having written on them, um, uh, uh, or s s others are actively involved in the issues um, um, and play a major role uh, in uh, European political processes um, that are trying to grapple uh, with the problem. Uh, and then we have people who are well acquainted with dealing these, with these kinds of issues um, on the court, uh, such as on courts such as the European Court of Human Rights, or also national constitutional court like the Polish constitutional court. So we have expertise of a great variety uh, assembled here. Uh, and the way that I think we should proceed uh, is <coughs> we'll begin, uh, Kim, if we can start with you for five to seven minutes, then we'll move on to uh, Lech. <coughs> Um, and then we'll I'll have um, uh, um, uh, uh, Professor Zadorsky and Professor uh, Jan Werner Müller. Um, <coughs> uh, your discussion, I understand, will focus more on remedies, uh, and your discussions uh, will presumably focus more on what's actually going on and, and what, how we can make sense of what's going on. So, please, Kim. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, well, I, uh, we have a number of different countries on the table, but I'm going to use my opening comments mostly to talk about what's happening in Hungary. Um, so uh, there are a lot of different theories about what's happening in Hungary. Um, I tend to follow the pirate ship theory, um, which is that I think this was a constitutional <coughs> government that was going along quite normally, and then the ship got boarded by pirates and it's been taken off in some other direction. Okay, so let me try to fill in what that metaphor uh, means. Um, Hungary had a constitutional system uh, in which it was the first country in Eastern Europe to get a new constitution, grew out of the round table, a set of amendments that happened in 1990, set up a very powerful constitutional <coughs> court. Um, the system more or less functioned uh, in a fairly stable way through six elections, which were all free and fair elections, through a constitutional court, most of whose decisions were actually uh, enacted, uh, were followed, and those that weren't were not followed because the parliamentary process required supermajority votes in some cases. So it was, a, it was a constitutional system that was more or less working. And then it went off the rails. And so how did it go off the rails? Well, one lesson to learn is that many constitutions have structural problems built into them. And the Hungarian constitutional system had one of these structural problems. The structural problem um, was that, first of all, the <coughs> election law was designed imagining that there was going to be a very fragmented party system. And so there it, was, it became a kind of disproportionate election law because the worry was that there'd be a million small parties that wouldn't form a stable government. And so the election law was designed to put a thumb on the scale 
of the party that won the plurality in the election to give them more seats so that you would get stable governments. That was the diagnosis in 1990 of what the problem was, and that's why they designed the election law that way. Um, that particular provision interacted badly with another constitutional provision, which was that the Constitution from 1949 actually on had a, had a clause that said the, it was a lightly entrenched Constitution. The Constitution could be changed by a single two-thirds vote, any part of it. Okay. The problem that happened in 2010 was that those two things came together in a particularly toxic way. So the party system had by that time been reduced to a sort of a two-and-a-half party system where the socialists who had been in power when the GDP growth went from plus three to minus seven in two years, and no government will survive that, plus they had corruption problems and a series of other issues, the socialists were going to be voted out. <coughs> the main alternatives were Jobbik, which is a kind of neo-fascist party, although I, I shouldn't say that on camera, because if you say that in Hungary, you can get fined um, for libel. So a far-right party. Jobbik. Um, and then the al other alternative was this party Fidesz, which actually won the election. And everybody knew going into the 2010 election that they would win big. What happened was that they got 53 percent of the vote, and that disproportionate election law turned this into 68 percent of the seats. And then they, with no other party but them, and they, they're technically a joint party with the Christian Democrats, but that's, they're, the Christian Democrats are not a seriously independent party. Their, with their one parliamentary bloc, they could change anything. And so they did. Okay. So now, three years later, 12 amendments changing 60 provisions of the Constitution they inherited to weaken a lot of institutions so that they could do what happened next, which was to engage in essentially a one-party constitutional drafting process where they wrote a Constitution <laughs> whose main goal, I believe, is to keep this party in power forever. They've now amended that Constitution five times. One of the amendments was a 15-page amendment to a 45-page Constitution. Um, they've redrafted the electoral law, the civil code, the criminal code. If you look at the parliamentary website where they brag about how many laws they have, last I looked it was 738 laws in three years. They've rewritten the entire legal system. And much of, what, much of what they've done is to engage in reform that a lot of people thought was necessary. So, for example, the old electoral system had electoral, single member electoral districts where some were two and a half times the population of others, you know, which clearly was a broken problem, had to be fixed. They've redrawn all the districts, and now it turns out that they've gerrymandered the entire country so that if, the two, if Fidesz and the Socialists, the two main parties, get the identical vote in the next election, Fidesz will still get a lot more seats. Um, so then they've done this all the way through the legal system, where they've essentially drafted a number of laws, many of which look not that objectionable on their face. I mean, some are really obnoxious laws, but some of them are actually quite sane laws or laws that you can point to in other countries that in the particular context work to keep this party in power forever. So here was a constitutional system kicking along in a country that has one of the best resources any country can have, which is a real devotion to rule of law. And that's one of the reasons why, when this party captures the entire legal system and writes all the rules, the opposition will roll over and play dead because no one would think of violating the law. It's normally a tremendous resource. In this context, it turns out to be something of a disadvantage because uh, under the election that will happen next spring, when the opposition will unfortunately probably lose, um, even if they won, it would be extremely hard for them to change this because it would be extremely hard for them to, to, to gain all of the levers of power that this prior government currently has. And so just one last thing with my, I think I'm going over time, but just one last thing to say about this. This has all happened in a completely legal fashion. There was really never a moment of illegality in the whole system. And that's one of the reasons why it's disabled a lot of its critics and why the EU has had a very hard time with it. EU has no trouble if a country just, you know, like Romania, threatens the constitutional judges, threatens to throw out the law, violates their own law. I mean, the EU knows how to deal with that. But most international organizations don't know how to deal with a country in which this purely legal stuff has happened. So this has been what's really caused a lot of dilemmas, I think, in trying to figure out what a response is. Um, the government has been extremely effective in launching a sort of public relations campaign about their devotion to rule of law. And this is where we all have to now wonder whether rule of law needs to have a more substantive, fulsome definition about content and not just about form. Great. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I 
start with the same uh, concept of uh, pirates uh, taking <laughs> over uh, the Hungarian ship, even if it is maybe a little bit complicated in the geographical location of Hungary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but still, uh, the problem is, uh, however, as you already mentioned, that those pirates are not those uh, bloody uh, guys uh, with uh, swords uh, and uh, axes. They are civilized pirates, and they are using uh, the legal system, and they are at least uh, appearing to stick uh, to existing uh, procedures uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and institutions. And uh, as I know nothing about Hungary as such, uh, I rather would uh, focus uh, on uh, one uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical issue, namely uh, the use uh, of uh, constitutional amendments uh, for uh, this, uh, let's say, pirating uh, uh, business. <laughs> and then uh, the problem, OK, the fact is uh, that uh, there is something wrong with it. That those constitutional amendments uh, uh, within last uh, years uh, have been used uh, in a way which uh, raises uh, serious objections. But now the problem is uh, how to squeeze it into traditional categories of constitutional law. Number one, well, constitutional amendment is by definition super legitimate expression of will of the people. Two-third majority in parliament. It's not only Hungary, there are many other parliaments when it is uh, uh, sufficient uh, to uh, have the constitution uh, amended. So if we are talking about, let's say, counter-majoritarian <laughs> problems, here we have a super counter-majoritarian problem because uh, this is a consecrated decision of the super majority uh, of the democratically elected uh, parliament. And then, uh, there is another reason which uh, uh, is more specific, let's say, under the Hungarian tradition. Uh, after 1989, uh, constitutional amendments has always been a legitimate instrument to rewrite the constitution or practically to create a new constitution. And this was uh, exactly the same process uh, which started in 1989 and which uh, resulted uh, in a uh, Theoretically, the old communist constitution still being in force, uh, but substantively, uh, absolutely new constitution. So now what they are doing uh, is more or less the same, uh, only more concentrated uh, uh, in time. And this leads me to this uh, particular question. So what is wrong, or rather how to define what is wrong? Because generally speaking, constitutional amendment is a legitimate procedure everywhere. And this everywhere is recognized uh, that uh, the parliaments or the uh, referendums uh, should have uh, a power to amend uh, constitution. On the other hand, uh, uh, this accumulation of different amendments may suggest uh, that we should look uh, for some uh, pathologies or pathological types of constitutional amendment. And this is what I uh, proposed uh, to uh, call either entrenchment abuse uh, or nullification abuse, namely entrenchment when uh, the constitutional when the function of the constitutional amendment is to con is, is to rank to a constitutional level <coughs> several matters uh, that normally belong to ordinary legislation, which again is nothing wrong in a, a principle. But uh, the result is uh, that uh, the next parliament uh, may be very limited <coughs> uh, in its uh, legislative function. And this already is a problem under the general concept uh, of uh, a parliamentary system or of the separation of powers. And the same with, uh, with another abuse, namely nullification abuse. Well, that uh, constitutional amendment may be used to overrule a particular decision of the Constitutional Court or the Supreme Court uh, is also well known to the history of this country. But now, if it is being done uh, in a systematic manner, and if those constitutional amendments intervene also uh, in the composition of the judiciary or in the validity of uh, the existing case law, 
uh, this is much more than cord packing. Uh, this is uh, uh, case law packing. And this is something which, again, is problematic uh, under the general idea of separation of powers uh, and uh, of what uh, should be reserved for the uh, judicial branch. So if we can define, let's say, those uh, two pathologies, then the question is uh, about remedies. Uh, and this uh, brings me to these discussions we already had last time, uh, namely, on the one hand, unconstitutional constitutional amendment. Can a constitutional amendment adopt it uh, in a correct procedure, nevertheless uh, be unconstitutional in its substance or simply illegitimate in its, in its substance. I think more and more courts around the world uh, is ready to accept such possibility. And it seems that upon the practice and more and more countries around the world, uh, this uh, may be something which uh, may be really necessary, or at least useful in the uh, present uh, conditions. Then uh, the other uh, is the role of the supranational jurisdictions. In Europe, uh, there are at least two supranational courts with very different powers, but both have already addressed the problem of constitutions and constitutional provisions and constitutional amendments. Both are of the opinion that this is within their, their jurisdiction. And also, this may be some kind uh, of uh, a remedy or panaceum if those uh, Inter uh, supranational court would uh, intervene. Uh, this uh, all might have uh, another uh, advantage, and this is my last uh, uh, remark, uh, namely political interventions launched by, let's say, the Commission or other political bodies of Europe immediately bring uh, the, us into a confrontation between uh, uh, legal system and politics. Interventions by the judiciary particularly supranational judiciary, allows us to keep the problem still within a uh, legal framework uh, of uh, functioning of the system, which uh, may at least uh, produce a pretension, an appearance uh, that uh, it is not a purely political intervention. Thank you, Lang. Uh, OK, I would like to uh, structure my, my short remarks along the three main points. The first is about the legitimacy and practicality of the EU interference in Hungarian affairs as a part of the broader idea of the EU monitoring of democracy in member states. Second, about whether the EU <coughs> so far actually has made a difference in what's going on there. And thirdly, if I have time, very briefly, some, at least one particular lesson that can be drawn for constitutional issues from this. And I will structure my uh, remarks by responding to those comments of students who have been s had been sent to us which address uh, specifically my note or my uh, introductory, uh, introductory note. So first there is the issue of, let's say, the general framework and the legitimacy of the EU in the first place to intervene with the, uh, wh whenever it depicts democratic defects in member uh, states. And this is raised very eloquently by George Drapkin, who invites uh, uh, speakers to, I quote, speak about the theoretical framework justifying EU intervention and any potential conflict with democratic principles, unquote. And I would say that uh, after the uh, enlargement of 2004 and 2007, this matter has been, so to speak, resolved. That is that the EU has tacit but very powerful legitimacy to intervene on, democratic, on democracy issues because it was one of the fundamental rationales for the enlargement and accession into the uh, Central and Eastern Europe. This is a point which I developed in some detail in my last year's book called Constitutionalism and the Enlargement of Europe. But, and what I'm saying is that both from the point of view of the internal forces within then candidate states, but also within the then old member states, the concerns about weakness and vulner democratic vulnerability of, of post-communist Central and Eastern Europe was one of the fundamental motives which triggered the enlargement. And therefore, an idea that consolidated democracy is in the interest both of those post-communist states, but also in the interest of stability of Europe, has been one of the fundamental, I would say, justifying factors of the enlargement. And therefore, whatever 
theoretical problems we can find with imposing, so to speak, democracy upon some of the recalcitrant states, I think this is a matter which is uh, 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 deci a decided issue, uh, an issue that the one of the fundamental aspects of legitimacy of the EU is that it is a stabilizing factor in consolidating democracy in its member states. So we have the issue of, you know, how can it be done and what does it say about the democratic weaknesses of the member states? And Chris Beshara say, asks basically the question, well, what sort of democracy can we talk about, you know, if you need the external factors rather than indigenous factor, uh, indigenous forces to uh, maintain or impose democracy? And I would say that when we look at the whole issue of pre-accession conditionality, the fundamental philosophy of democracy or sort of Copenhagen conditions of democracy was that there is, n that there is a fundamental synergy between the external factors and internal factors. None are taken uh, sort of in separation, but that, the, but that the fundamental guarantor or guarantee of efficiency of uh, securing consolidated democracy is support by the EU, what I call the Euro straight jacket, so to speak, for internal, domestic, indigenous, democratic, liberal forces. So it's none of these things taken uh, separately, but the synergy, the interconnection between the external and internal, which was the, if you like, the mechanism of conditionality and which prefigured current monitoring uh, function of the EU. And finally, there is the, the question, but you know, can, can it be done actually within the current, uh, within the cover, current power structure, which is still very much state-based, so that Ashley Fernandez asks, well, we have this fundamental collective action problem there, will states do it? And Navi Ukabiala says, after all, you know, the European Parliament is dominated by EPP and, uh, uh, and Fidesz is part of it. Is it realistic that they'll do it? And I must say I'm a great enthusiast of at least trying to trigger the first section of Article 7 uh, within the Parliament itself, that even if it doesn't proceed to the actual determination that actual se uh, seven section one mentions, the very fact that the parliament will trigger the article seven uh, process will have a tremendous political and symbolic meaning. And therefore, I, I do not think that it is, it is not plausible. I mean, K K Kim in her wonderful introduction or comment on Tavares' report says that although we do not, we cannot know who voted how, at least probably about one half of EPP MPs must have voted against the Hungarian government. So it's not so implausible. Now very briefly about two other points if I have a, a few minutes. Very has, briefly. Can I? Or? Very briefly. Okay. Okay, so has EU so far made a difference? And both Brittany Busselato and Chris Nern uh, make points that this is basically only language. And this language may often be just facade for not doing nothing. But wh what I said in, the, in my note, I, I really stand by. I believe that the very fact that both the Romanian, but more importantly, Hungarian governments have been forced to adopt the vocabulary which is accepted in the EU, and rather than saying, uh, who are you to impose something on us? Saying, well, we are in fact doing what other countries are doing is an extremely important political factor. So language matters, rhetoric matters, and they have been in a sense socialized into using the acceptable language of democratic, uh, uh, of liberal democratic uh, vocabulary rather than type of nationalistic or xenophobic language to Europe. And the last issue, the last issue is a very interesting point which Tamara Morgenthau makes. Maybe in future we should strengthen this sort of constitutional conditionality and impose upon uh, candidate states a requirement of having some non-derogable constitutional provisions. So here we, we go into basically the question of eternity clauses in, in national constitutions. I must say that I'm very skeptical about it. Both, uh, I believe that as such, non-derogable, non-amendable constitutional provisions are something which is internal contradiction, which basically is a logical and constitutional upset. The only way of understanding is by, is by strengthening the power of constitutional courts to decide about what amendments are consistent and what are not with the, uh, with the spirit of the Constitution. But I believe that 
part of the pro that constitutional court of Hungary has been part of the problem rather than part of the solution. That it should look itself into the mirror. And this is my last point, that if we look back into the constitutional structure of what happened before the last Fidesz government is that we had this extremely powerful and sort of like self-indulgent indulgent constitutional court which disfavored adopting a full, fully fledged new constitution uh, because it uh, empowered it by uh, putting it in the position of writing the quote unquote invisible constitution. So in a sense it contributed to this constitutional void which Orban then exploited so smartly and with such detriment to Hungarian democracy. Thank you. Jan? So three, possibly four points also in response to some of the response papers for which, by the way, I'm, I'm grateful. First of all, it's clear that whatever the EU comes up with cannot be seen to be tailored to a particular case, that it needs to conform, so to speak, to the rule of law of the rule of law. In any case, Hungary and Romania present very different situations. But maybe what is also worth saying is that they're not the only two quote unquote bad apples. In fact, you might say that less than 10 years after accession to the EU, we have a whole series of what you might really call constitutional crises, certainly something that goes beyond day-to-day -day political conflict. Think of Bulgaria, think of Slovenia, think of the Czech Republic, where earlier this year we had an almost Weimar-style situation and a confrontation between a directly elected president and a parliament. And just imagine for a second if the one remaining Kaczynski were to come back in Poland, which could happen, and he presumably would have by now also learned the lesson that everybody is trying to learn from Orban, namely to really uh, do things properly, you have to have a new constitution and entrench your partisan preferences. Now, that's a question I think that needs to be put on the table. A discussion about this is developing. Uh, one contributor to this discussion, for instance, has already been saying that perhaps the very fact that so-called new constitutionalism in Central and Eastern Europe has never really properly connected to a lived political experience in the region is one of the underlying reasons. Be that as it may, that's not a question that I assume we as political theorists and lawyers can answer in this room today. So what can lawyers answer? Well, just a second about remedies or possible remedies. Now, there's a lot of room here for, if you like, technocratic tinkering. How could we use EU law to bring about certain effects? And that's an important discussion. But I think it's also important to look at what you might call the underlying logic of the different proposals. Because these underlying logics are quite different when you look at it carefully. Article 7, of which the last great fan is sitting next to, is <laughs> sitting next to me, <laughs> essentially when you think about what it really does by taking away the votes of a government in the European Council, what it really does is not a form of intervention. It doesn't intervene in the country. It basically presents what you might call a sort of normative ostracism or isolationism. It basically says, we, the rest of the EU, do not want to be subject to the decisions of a government where we have reason to believe that its liberal democratic credentials are in doubt. So we're basically isolating ourselves from the effect that this government could have on us, but we're not, really do any, we're not doing anything directly in the country. Now, some of you have talked about excluding a country altogether from the EU. That's not possible. You can't do that. You could have a military dictatorship in the EU, and you could take away the votes of that regime, but you cannot expel a country from the European Union. Now, you might say that this current situation is not a stable, is not a stable one. And one lesson one might learn from federal states, never mind whether the EU is a federal state or not, just for the sake of argument for now, is that to have a functioning polity, you either need to have intervention or the possibility of intervention, or you need to have the possibility of kicking a constituent part of the polity out. But one of the two needs to be in place. And the EU right now has neither. And that's not a stable, that's not a stable situation. A rival remedy is to have an independent body tentatively called the Copenhagen Commission, which could essentially cut funds to a country and therefore would actually intervene in what is happening 
what is happening within a country. So I'm just trying to underline that Article 7 and Copenhagen Commission, they're not on the same level. They're not trying to do the same thing. They're quite different ways of thinking about the problem and how to, how to address it. Now, some of you have asked about the political feasibility of something like a Copenhagen Commission. I think the answer to that is it depends on the overall context. I think the case for it would be immeasurably strengthened if one thing happens, which quite a lot of people in Europe right now want to happen, namely the conscious politicization of the European Commission with a president of the Commission who basically will not be directly elected, but where the outcome of a European election can be, have the effect of having a Commission president who has some kind of popular backing. If that were to happen, it's going to be much harder to say that the European Commission is something like the neutral guardian of the treaties, if basically we want it to be recognizable as a partisan institution. It might not happen, but if it were to happen, then having an independent body like the Copenhagen Commission is no longer just optional, it's mandatory, because we couldn't have a European Commission that is visible as a partisan actor go to a country where possibly you would have a government of a different partisan stripe and sort of go head to head with a country like, like that. Now, the other thing that I think is, is worth saying is that apart from the European Commission, there really aren't any alternatives for the kind of role of guardianship that at least some of us are looking for. Sometimes it's said that, look, Copenhagen Commission, the typical EU thing, when we can't substantively solve a problem, we invent a new institution instead and, you know, pay more bureaucrats to sit around somewhere in Europe, etc., etc. Um, and then usually people also say, well, look, we already have the Venice Commission, we have the Council of Europe, we have all these wonderful institutions already. Why something new on top of all that? Very brief answer, if I may. I think the Venice Commission has done an excellent job with regard both to Hungary and Romania. It's not possible to say that the track record is bad. Still, I think there are reasons to believe that the Council of Europe is not the right forum for the kinds of challenges we're talking about. First of all, it seems to me, it seems to me prima facie to raise a credi credibility problem that in a Council of Europe setting, Azerbaijan might be sitting in judgment of Hungary for reasons which I hope are clear enough. Second of all, I think prima facie it's advantageous to have a body that really is EU specific because a lot of law in a sense is, is, uh, is only available in an EU context. Think of something like data protection where the Council of Europe can't do very much, but where the EU might have a lot more mileage. And thirdly, the idea that you sometimes hear from political players that a kind of normative outsourcing, if that's the right word, also means that then the Council of Europe is going to be blamed and the EU will be blameless seems to me profoundly mistaken. It's the same mistake that people made in the Euro crisis when they brought in the IMF and said if the IMF is part of the Troika, the Greeks are only going to hate the IMF and not the Germans, not the ECB, and so on and so forth. You can't shift the blame like this, and you partly can't do it, because ultimately it will be the EU which has to basically implement the sanctions. So you can't sort of pass the buck in this, uh, in this way. Now, one other brief thing on this. It's sometimes then also said that, look, if the view is right, that top-down, technocratic, new constitutionalism since 2004 and before is part of the problem and not part of the solution, then this only is going to make things worse. It's more top-down stuff from the European side. Well, the answer to that is that this proposal doesn't exclude other approaches. And one that has been discussed is something like using the now available European Citizens Initiative. Which is, a, which is basically a bottom-up uh, way of saying we as European citizens are very worried about developments in a particular country. We're going to collect signatures and put it on the agenda of the European Commission. Personally, it's a very nice thing to say. You're going to prove your true democratic credentials by saying that's the way forward. But good luck finding a million people in Europe right now who are going to be really worried about, about Hungary. But be that as it may, it's not excluded as a rival, as a rival approach. Very last point, if I may, because that was, has also come up in some of the response papers. Um, what about the political repercussions of intervention as opposed to normative isolationism as implied in Article 7? People get very nervous about the, the danger of a kind of nationalist backlash within a country. People say, look, remember Austria 2000? The then Austrian Chancellor Wolfgang Schüssel was extremely smart at mobilizing Austrians against the EU, even if Austrians weren't all followers of Haider, and so on and so forth. 
So what to say about this? First of all, any country that does what, con what governments in Hungary and Romania and elsewhere have been doing know that they are on a collision course with the EU. So in all likelihood, no matter what the EU does, they're going to mobilize against the EU anyway. And that's already been happening in Hungary in particular. You don't have to wait for a nationalist backlash. Governments themselves will bring it about from the get-go. It's not going to be the effect of anything the EU does. It's going to be there anyway. Second of all, remaining neutral, so to speak, on the part of the EU is not in and of itself neutral. Because what you also will end up doing is disappointing all those citizens within a country who said or who thought that with accession they now had safeguards against backsliding. And to do nothing is then essentially to say to these citizens, you thought that locking yourself into these supranational arrangements was going to protect you from certain political scenarios, but sorry, we can't do anything. So doing nothing is not neutral in that, uh, in that, uh, in that sense. Now, we can discuss further about whether this would uh, sort of open up a Pandora's box of nationalist tit for tat, the kind of things that member states clearly are very nervous about. Um, but then you might say that, look, we can't have it both ways. I mean, if you, if you, if you want uh, some measure of politicization in the EU, ultimately, then that's the price you have to pay for it, because politics means that you can't always predict what is going to happen. And I'll finish on that. Um, Happy note. Great. So uh, thank you, um, all the panelists. Um, now, I think instead of, I think what we'll do is we'll turn it over right away um, instead of first having a panel discussion here. But I'd like, uh, the, que I'd like the questions, we, I wanted to divide up the rest of our session into two parts. The first one, which will be a shorter part, uh, which only 20, 30 minutes at most, it's about <coughs> trying to get an understanding and deepening our understanding of of what is actually going on in parts of Eastern Europe and in Hungary in particular, and how that is related to constitutionalism and what exactly is wrong in constitutional terms. Clarifying what exactly is, wh what, what exactly the problem is um, uh, and how to best uh, give an account of that problem. So if there are questions and suggestions and comments uh, on that issue, those are the ones that we'll start off with. The, so now you should raise your hand in a minute. In the 30 seconds, you should raise your hand. The second part, because the second part is going to be about remedies. Uh, there we're going to discuss the kinds of proposals and the kind of ideas that have already been articulated here with regard to how to best counter these types of developments. But that's a separate, I want that to be a separate issue. So to begin with, only on the first issue, what is going on on the ground and, and et cetera. So that, Raise your hands now if you want to say something uh, about that. OK. Um, thank you. A fascinating pa panel. Can I uh, leave the question about remedies then later on? Mm -hmm. I hope to come back to that sure. if I may. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the problem, I'm, I'm very much uh, taken with, uh, with, with your analysis of, of, of it. But <coughs> just to say a little more about it. I mean, it's unclear to me what exactly the problem is that's being presented. Um, it could be a problem of constitutionalism, that is that we don't like a particular constitutional structure that's not appropriate. Or we could be objecting, as I think Kim was hinting, that there is something substantive, yes. evil or bad, that they're doing, for example, in terms of rights violations. If it's the latter, then there are rights remedies. Then we go to the European Court of Human Rights, ultimately, essentially. But that doesn't seem to me to be the essence of the problem that's actually being identified yet. Right? The essence of the problem seems to be one of constitutional structure that's being challenged. But then the question about principle, what the principle intervention would be, I think is very problematic indeed. Because, uh, to be honest, in terms of what's been described, I'm not sure constitutionally I see any real difference between what's going on in Hungary and what the constitutional structure, for example, the United Kingdom is. Right? So there's weak separation of powers, there is in the United Kingdom. It's party dominated, there is in the United Kingdom. Constitutional amendments are written by the party, they are here. Um, it gives um, uh, the winning party more seats than uh, the number of, of uh, uh, that would be expected. And that's the United Kingdom. There's no constitutional court. That's the United Kingdom. So I don't understand what exactly you would intervene with in the Hungarian context. It wouldn't also.
also justified an intervention in the United Kingdom. Now, some of you may think that would be a good thing, but I can tell you the United Kingdom is not going to vote for that. Yeah. Very good. We'll have one more before it goes back to the panel. Pasquale. Yeah. Well, I think that I have something to say which is connected with the remedy, so I will no, speak that's later. Yeah. Yeah. Good. There's a question. Here. Go on. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to, to, to react to uh, your point, I think that the major difference between the United Kingdom and Hungary and other countries is the lack of constitutional culture yeah. uh, in a situation where, where the institutional setting might be very, very similar. But I wanted to react to the discussion between King and Wojciech uh, about the, the role of the constitutional court and more broadly uh, the role of the legal constitutionalism as it called by Dokas' uh, uh, recently published book. So whether this is one of the problems, uh, uh, I, I tend to agree with Wojciech. Although I have to confess in the first seven years when I was at the Constitutional Court of Hungary, I was admired by the, in, the, the idea of invisible constitution, but retrospectively seeing this was one of the failures, certainly. Uh, for the same reason, for this lack of constitutional culture, uh, the former president of, of the court, uh, Laszlo Shoyom, recently uh, 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 arguing uh, with the same argument, we will be protected by the constitutional culture of Hungary, which does not exist uh, uh, <coughs> so the, uh, But the problem is that, that the original intention was a two-step constitution making process. And this was only one step in 89. The first step was a, 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 a preliminary constitutional amendment, even if it, it was a, a very comprehensive amendment. But still, as Wojciech has, has said, this was the old constitution should have been uh, 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 changed with a, with a new one. This second step failed. And this is one of, one of the reasons of backsliding. Uh, that, that the constitutional system was not able to protect any more uh, constitutional values embedded in the, in the uh, 89 constitution. Right. So is that, would you like to get to, to respond to um, yeah. either of the, either or both of these issues? Or maybe we yeah. just go through from, yeah. from Jan uh, over to Leg. So very briefly, um, I think it's important exactly to make the point that what we're talking about are not just fundamental rights violations, mm -hmm. uh, which is also why then some of the proposed remedies that we didn't talk about here, but that some people bring up and say, look, we already have the fundamental rights agency, we have the courts, you know, what's the problem? Um, it's important to say that, look, I mean, obviously we don't want to trivialize fundamental rights violations, but we have institutions for that. What we're talking about is really a democracy problem. And we're talking about governments engaging in very systemic, systematic um, actions. I mean, if you look at the Romania case, which we didn't talk about, there, there was a game plan, how you were going to do that. Not just one-off problems, not one-off mistakes, but you were going to fundamentally reshape the political system in such a way that you really were unlikely to have real turnover of power. I think that's the essence of it. Now, you can say that, look, there are other actors in Europe who are trying to do these things. Is that really enough? for a criterion to isolate r truly problematic cases. I think it is in the sense that, I mean, this is my one and a half minute analysis of all of Eastern Europe and what's happening. So what, what I think what you have in a number of cases is deeply split political establishments or party systems, not necessarily deeply split countries. And the typical move is to say that, look, the opposition is illegitimate unlike in the UK. No conception of a loyal opposition. The opposition doesn't even belong to the country, uh, is an enemy of the nation, etc., etc. Not always said openly, but that's the basic idea. Hence, if you really believe that, it becomes legitimate to construct a one-party state. Again, to put it very crudely, but that, that's I mean, what Kim was talking about. The fact that if you are the only truly legitimate representative of the nation, it's okay to occupy the state and to reshape everything in line with what you consider the only legitimate representation of what the country is truly about. That goes beyond day-to-day -day political conflict. 
Um, and that also goes beyond sort of some of the typical examples, counterexamples, you know, Italy under Berlusconi and so on. How is that different? Well, it is different in some <coughs> ways. And then once I think you, you've identified that core problem, it's possible to work out criteria, which I was trying to put forward in, in, in my written contribution of, you know, what then should trigger intervention uh, or what you might want to wait for before you, before you, before you do anything. Now, these matters are, I hasten to add, questions of judgment. I think the EU itself is in danger of backsliding to the bad old days of pre-accession when, you know, you would send in the, um, the box tickers and you have your rule of law checklist and you say, ah, oh, do they have computers in the courtrooms? Yes. Do they have all three years of legal education? Yes. Rule of law, big, you know, big tick and so on. That's not how we're going to tackle these problems. There is going to be an element of judgment, which is another way of saying it's not a mechanical application of rules. Somebody, in a sense, has to make a call as to whether a system is beyond day-to-day -day conflict or not. Okay, what happened in, uh, what happened in the uh, Central East European countries in the second half of the first decade of this century is that uh, certain artificial but necessary liberal consensus, which was necessary to support triple transition, transition to market economy, transition to democratic structure and Europeanization, <laughs> collapsed, and it had to collapse because you cannot maintain that degree of limits upon democracy for too long. Uh, somehow there was this certain need for mobilization to, for these societies to move, to undertake in a very short time this historically extremely important and difficult and challenging transitions. And you couldn't do it in a fully democratic way. You couldn't do it in a sort of like participatory or even deliberative way because these changes would never happen. And in particular, preparation for the accession to the EU wouldn't have happened. So there was a, a sort of suspension of a deep participatory democracy. What happened after the accession was the, with the relaxation of that type of necessary discipline, the democracy, so to speak, with all its as ugly aspects as well prevailed over, uh, if you like, liberal constitutional constraints. Some of the countries which had good constitutional structure in place managed to somehow protect themselves against the worst aspects of it. And I think Poland or Slovakia or Baltic states are examples. But some countries where this sort of type of elitist liberal consensus went to the extreme uh, so the uh, particular via violent reaction against it, when it was no longer necessary to sustain the like, consensus for the entry to the, to the <coughs> EU. And I think Hungary is just an example of it. And I would like to go back to the Constitutional Court, which under Shoyom and in its sort of like glorious early days, from my point of view, showed the worst aspects of this type of illiberal, uh, non-democratic arrogance and uh, self-indulgence. I remember uh, Pasquale Pasquino with John organized a series of sort of seminars with the help of Olivetti, Olivetti Foundation and we had Laszlo Shorium there. And he, with a straight face, not as a joke, but as a serious matter, said, we are in, we, Constitutional Court, are an aristocracy which will lead our society to democracy. He didn't see the paradox of it. And I think that what happened now with the dissolution of constitutional structure in Hungary is simply democratic, very democratic, violent reaction against that type of attitude. Mm -hmm. We love each other, but we disagree on everything. So I'm going to do the opposite of the Hungarian story with respect to the Constitutional Court. And, and to, to get to your point about well, so what's wrong here. So the, the problem here is that it's a party state that cannot rotate power anymore, given the way it's set up. And so, you know, you need a certain degree of checked powers, and you need the possibility for power to rotate or else you don't have a democratic state. And, and this needs to be, in looking at sort of what's wrong with the institutions in Hungary, the whole thing needs to be approached systemically, right? So, so what I'm concerned about is the checklist approach. You know, so do we have parties? Yes. Do we have, you know, do, do parties write amendments? Yes. You can't look at this that way. You have to look at how the whole government is organized. And the first thing to say about Hungary is that it's a unicameral parliamentary system unicameral parliamentary system. There is no upper house. There is no independently elected president. The president is elected by the parliament. The local governments, while they were independent for 20 years, never really acted as an alternative source of power. 
So the reason why I have long been a defender of the Hungarian Constitutional Court is, first of all, I like re judicial review better than Wojciech in general. But in this system, it was the only check on a unicameral parliamentary system. It had to be that strong, or else you had simply no, there was no one to tell a government no, because every other institution was run from the unicameral parliamentary system. And if you had a strong block in that parliament, it could do anything. So that's why when this government came into power, it had to disable the constitutional court. And then because the system was not set up with that, with more checks, I mean, it had some other checks, but they also turned out to be easily overrun. Once that happened, what you've now got is a unicameral parliamentary system with no checks. So for example, this Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which, which Lech was hinting at the, uh, a, a moment ago, this was the 15-page amendment to the 45-page Constitution. What it did was to take virtually every major decision the Constitutional Court had ruled against the government and put the unconstitutional laws directly into the Constitution. It then nullified the 22 years of jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court in the years in the run-up to this Constitution so that none of those cases could be relied upon any longer by this court. And then it added a provision that said, and the Constitutional Court may not review constitutional amendments for their substantive constitutionality, which is to say any time the court does something the government doesn't like, the government sticks it in the Constitution and goes on. This is not a system of any kind of check on power. Okay? Britain has an upper house. Britain has strong local governments. Britain has strong constitutional culture. And Britain now has a more independent Supreme Court. All of those are, you know, are, are really big differences. And that's why you can't do the checklist. Right? You can't just say, does this country have that? Does, you can't just look at strong judicial review as if it sits outside a governmental structure. Right? You needed that strong court in Hungary because it was the only check. And my last thing to say is just that I've written about this concept as the idea, uh, worried about what I call the idea of the Franken-state. Right? Well, the Franken-state, which is what Hungary's been so good at, takes, you know, here's a law from Denmark, here's a law from Norway, here's something the UK does, and put it together. And every time Europe comes in with its checklist, and Viviana Redding, who's been very brave and, you know, trying to criticize Hungary as it's gone along, has nonetheless come up with what I think is not a very good idea which is her justice scorecard. And it's this checklist. And you know she'll find the Danish law and the Norwegian law and the UK law in the Hungarian context. Hungary will pass the checklist the way that Frankenstein's monster was once composed of pieces from living bodies. they are corpses when he did it, but still they were living bodies that look kind of normal. And you put it together, and it makes a monster, right? So what, what the Hungarians have been so clever at doing is taking all these laws that one, one, one by one in checklist fashion look fine and put it together to create this thing that will constantly rotate power back into one party. And that's the problem. And we'll talk about rights in the next round. I have a, something to say about why it's not your father's rights that are being violated, it's our grandkids' rights that are being violated. Because, one, can I say one last thing about this? Because the checklist of things we protect as human rights are the signature violations of the 20th century authoritarian regimes. And now what's happened, what new authoritarianisms do, is they take market forces and they direct them at their opponents. So that what happens to their opponents is unemployment, um, is systemic exclusion, uh, is not being able to find jobs, not being able to get an education, not being able to get any of those things. And then the government says, wasn't us, it was the market. And those are not conceptualized as human rights violations. Even when, as in the Hungarian case, they've been incredibly clever. Hungary's a government under an austerity program. They've aimed all the austerity measures at the political opposition. And then they say, you don't have a job? It's Europe. You can go to Germany and get a job. You can go to the UK and get a job. And what's the human rights violation in that? So that's why it doesn't look like a human rights violation, because they've, they've aimed their abuse of their, uh, uh, against their opponents at things that we don't think of as rights. The question is, uh, what is wrong with the constitutionalism if it is not uh, working, at least in Hungary, and I think this is mostly on uh, the problem of these checks and balances. And the very system of constitutionalism is based uh, on the assumption that at least the constitution as such uh, is untouchable. Okay, there is constitutional amendment procedure, but this requires uh, higher majorities or super majorities. And then uh, the rule is uh, that in normal country, for a constitutional amendment, you must have 
majority and opposition going together. And then it is legitimate and then there is no problem. If this system is not working, and in Austria this uh, long tradition of grand coalitions also showed that constitution could be instrumentalized, but if this system is not working, then uh, we have a problem because, let's say, the cornerstone of the constitutionalism, namely untouchable constitution, at least constitution untouchable by one political party, is no longer untouchable. And then uh, all other pieces uh, simply uh, fall, uh, fall apart. Do we need a strong constitutional court? Uh, I, I think we do. I think even now in Hungary, this is still at least as, as long as Pacholi is there, there is, let's say, the last uh, stand <coughs> uh, protecting some, uh, uh, some values. Uh, it was a reference uh, to Poland and Kaczynski. I think also during this brief two years uh, of Kaczynski's in Poland, it was the Constitutional Court who did not allow this madness uh, to be transformed uh, into uh, legal action. So Constitutional Court may be, may be important and may be more useful uh, than uh, some uh, other organism because it's already well established uh, uh, institution uh, uh, around the world. So before we go <coughs> on to question two, we'll have one more round on this um, and we'll collect the questions and we'll start with Sujit. So <coughs> I just want to jump into this exchange between uh, Chris and Jan Werner about what, what is the harm here that we're trying to identify. And it might be, you know, so, so, yeah, so, so one answer might be that um, if a government um, and as it were, backslides or changes its existing ar arrangements, then that creates an, a kind of a burden of justification to provide a public regarding reason for why it is that it's, that it's under, undertaking a change in its arrangements, right? So it's, it's actually the, it's the change itself and the benchmark is the government's own benchmark, what its previous arrangements were, right? And it has to provide some credible justification that, 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 that that provides a case for why it's making those arrangements other than the nakedly partisan one uh, of self-dealing. And so that type of, you know, so that, you know, that might be one answer. That, you know, th I'm just wondering how people might react to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> do you want to? No, no, not immediately. Yeah. We'll yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my question would be, uh, if someone could still sort of also a little bit uh, go more detail about Romania, what is then Romania's problem and, and in what way is it you know, different from the Hungarian problem, which by now is you know, characterized pretty well. And the second aspect was, uh, it seemed it was not somehow mentioned enough. I, I come myself from, from Estonia, and I, I, I know many Estonian politicians. I know how they tick, and I, think, I imagine that some of these issues would be similar in comparable. And what I see in Estonia is a sort of strong uh, mm, tension between the conservative political forces and the liberal. And this tension is partly about uh, <coughs> end, end Sovietisierung, or, or this question, you know, who did what during the Soviet period, and how ought we to re relate to today. So, and, and I imagine that these Orbans and Kaczynskis have the very same tough conservative mindset, saying that, that you know, communists turned liberals, and they, they managed to sell both domestically using their previous connections. And, and using the sort of uh, fact that part of the Western European elites used to be whatever Trotskyists themselves in earlier decades, so, and, and, and that was never problematized, whereas they are not even the true patriots, something like that. And, and I'm wondering if, so, so I would like to somehow, um, because we are discussing this region, I, I'm trying to understand why is this region the way it is, and I'm wondering whether this is one, one aspect for explaining it. Mohammed? Somebody said that there's this sense, I guess, shared by both, that not the opponent is not a legitimate party. Uh, is that really the case, or is there more going on here? And would it could be mitigated by having a national office, like a national president, or a, a second chamber that is elected nationally through some sort of list? Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve House. Yeah. Uh, so first, to Kim, some, at one point you were saying that the uh, devotion of Hungarians to the rule of law was a a problem that 
isn't, can you say more about legal uncertainty, legal instability, the fact that laws are changing very often? In a way, this is sort of contrary to the spirit of the rule of law in some way. And then a more largely, I've listened to this, and uh, since diagnosis dictates remedy, uh, what I'm hearing is there really is no remedy. The way you're describing the problem seems to be much too deep for remedies. So they created a system where the opposition had no uh, a chance to take power. Even if it had a chance to take power, it couldn't change certain things. Even more so because a lot of the things they've changed aren't about laws. They're changing the resources of the country. They're destroying the middle class. They're destroying people's pensions. They're taking uh, and so forth. So these are very powerful. He has created uh, uh, voting rights for extraterritorial Hungarians, and we don't even know how many there are, so maybe we could change the number and don't let they have election oh, yeah. for security purposes. So he's yes. very entrenched. And so this would be, I mean, I'm not sure if that's what Lech was saying, but if you could have a, uh, a television program in which you convince people that some constitutional amendments are unconstitutional. That, that isn't a remedy to the situation. Obviously, this isn't going to have any political, that's not a political proposal. And the EU in this context, it's just, it's so much plays into, as I said, it plays into so much his basic rhetorical strength in the country. He is popular, which you haven't really, he is incredibly mm -hmm. popular. Or, so that, okay, incredibly popular. He's popular in a way that's yeah. very hard for us to understand. Right. Right. So that popularity and the perhaps mm -hmm. idiocy of the opposition, the capacity of the opposition, because that's another mm -hmm. aspect of just last point here. One of the reasons it seems like there is no remedy is that the opposition is so fragmented, so that's hopeless, right. so helpful. Mm -hmm. And right. that isn't just the fault of the Constitution. Yeah. So there's, a, yeah. there's another right. dynamic going on here, yeah. which is part of why mm -hmm. the situation seems so new. Great. Okay, so we'll start again here with Lech and move our way to the right. Lech. Well, I do not have uh, too much uh, uh, to add. Yeah, of course, if there is no opposition, then there is no problem. And uh, if uh, it is the fault of the opposition that it does not exist, uh, you cannot blame. You cannot blame Constitution. And I think this is also visible that there are some uh, strong political formations, post-communists, uh, or uh, more right-oriented, that uh, somehow uh, erupts as being strong and being able to, to get a majority and to form a government, and then somehow disappear, dissolve. Uh, and this, uh, as uh, it was uh, uh, characterized by our former Lech Walesa, uh, right leg and left leg are not uh, legs uh, simultaneously being of the same of, of the same size but this is the problem of political culture history this you ca you cannot enforce it by the by by the constitutional texts uh, so there may be some uh, more deep uh, reasons of the structural crisis but still <coughs> institutions may help or may hinder uh, some uh, Evolution uh, towards uh, what we, we do not do not like, uh, and this uh, minor role of institutions still should not be underestimated. <laughs> yeah, lots to lots to think about. So let me try to take some of the uh, thoughts um, backwards. So one is that one important thing about a lot of these places, and, and this is why Poland may be <coughs> somewhat more self-correcting than some of the others, is these are very small countries. And when you have very small countries, one of the things you have are elites, especially small countries where the door was locked for a long time, is that you have people who know each other way too well. Um, so everybody's friends with other people. One of the reasons why the opposition is so splintered comes down to things like this person's brother kicked somebody else's sister's shin in third grade. I mean, it's not quite like that. But it's these are very small elites in which people have very deep resentments and long histories with each other. And I think that means that the polarization is harder to overcome. Now, of course, you know, we're living in the U.S., which has also immense, you know, demonizing the opposition-style polarization. Um, but I think it's a very different dynamic in a big country than a small country, and that a lot of the East European countries are small countries. But I think that also, it, so then it becomes interesting to think about how do other small countries manage this, right? And this is where I think the, the cultural thing is not so much a constitutional culture, but a kind of civility culture 
right, about ways that you just treat other people and forms of demonization you don't do, or forms of privacy, right, things you don't inquire into about other people that enable you nonetheless to live together. Um, and so a lot of those kinds of structures are not in, in place in this part of the world. Um, and, 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 but I think it's also, they're also not in place in other parts of the world, too. I'm not sure the right unit here is Eastern Europe, actually, because not all the countries are doing equally badly. Um, and, you know, although after Slovenia ran into trouble, I began to wonder um, about that. But anyway, but, but the small country thing is a big chunk of it. Um, another piece of it, though, is that um, Orban is popular for the reasons Slory mentioned, which is he's been building up this anti-communism and the resentments of anti-communism and basically saying that you know, finally this government is bringing an end to the communist regime which you know they've they've they even talk about overthrowing the communist constitution which was negotiated at the round table when there were communists at the table but that doesn't mean that that constitution <coughs> didn't function in the in the interim so the anti-communist rhetoric is a big part of this okay but part of what's going on with the anti-communist rhetoric is that it's demonization of a certain um, part of the of the political class but also in Hungary at least there's a coded anti-semitism to the <coughs> anti-communism you know, it's one of the ways of doing anti-Semitism without letting the foreigners know what they're talking about, which is to say that very often the communists were the anti-fascists, and who were the people who had the most motivation to be anti-fascists, but the Jewish population in Hungary that survived, because Hungary is one of the few places where there's a surviving Jewish community after the Holocaust, if only because the Budapest ghetto would have been um, sent to Auschwitz if the war hadn't ended exactly when it did. So. So this is also part of what's going on. And Orban's playing the anti-Semitism card and the anti-Roma card quite subtly in code. And also, I think, you know, working not at entire cross purposes with Jobbik, this, you know, kind of neo-Nazi party. And this is a big chunk of what's kind of mobilizing. This kind of nationalism is being unleashed. I don't think for a minute Orban himself believes any of that. And the question is whether this is now unleashing a force that he's not going to be able to control. And there is, I think, a serious worry that where the thing will come from to sweep this away at some point is not going to be from the left but from the right. And I think that's a, that's a kind of serious, um, serious worry. So I didn't get all the way back to your questions, but I'll okay. stop there. Two, two points. First of all, I would like to very strongly support uh, and somehow uh, endorse what, uh, what Sujit said. Because very often in the discussions about Hungary, the, the, the questions are, OK, so you have you, they have weakened constitutional court. So what? The UK doesn't have the constitutional court in the first place, etc. You know, so mm -hmm. all of these things which happen in Hungary may be seen with the equivalents, and even more so in other democratic liberal states where we don't have any intuitive fundamental objections. And I think that the, the fundamental issue is that there is a great difference between a place which doesn't have certain structures and a place which has got those structures and then removes them. So everything is in the sequence. If the place doesn't have certain structures, such as constitutional court uh, and sort of like formal checks and balances in the constitution, it builds up certain remedies for it in a sort of like incremental way. But if you have brought about in a sort of like not evolutionary, but in a uh, constructive way, certain structures and then remove them, it creates a certain fundamental void. You know, so it's better not to have something in the first place because somehow the organism will get, uh, will become more resilient to, uh, to, to, the, to the faults of it, uh, as opposed to have it and then remove it. I think that's, that's the, the, the sequence is about uh, what, what matters in Hungary. And the second point, I would like to pick up your issue about, but how, how does Romania uh, differ from Hungary? And the only sort of similarity is that it more or less happened in the, around the same place, and, uh, uh, the, uh, the same time, and very close to each other, too. Yeah. So uh, the almost the same place. But uh, there is absolutely no comparison in terms of depth and importance for three main reasons. The first reason is that in Romania, we had just a simple, normal, routine matter of political corruption. So basically, the institution, constitution, uh, institutions have been used and abused for certain purposes. Okay, so okay, so we don't like what Ombudsman says, so we'll try to to uh, to to revoke Ombudsman, etc. Et However, they didn't try 
the Prime Minister didn't try to fundamentally change the constitutional structure so far. as they did in, so far as they did in uh, in Hungary. So this is this is the first reason. The second reason is that the Romanian conflict was totally non-ideological. Even though the Prime Minister was center left and the President was center right, there was almost no ideology in it. Well, Orban government is fi fundamentally and primarily ideological. There is a, a great sense of nationalistic, Christian, whatever ideol ideology added to it, and that makes it much more difficult in a sense uh, in its consequence. And the third point, which you already mentioned actually, is that the Hungarian uh, constitutional uh, uh, con uh, constitutional conflict has been placed against the very difficult issue of dealing with the past. So that the communist legacy has been brought back in order to support Orban's uh, uh, type of claim that he basically is the first one who wants to break with the unwholesome past. That, the, that his predecessor were either communists or some sort of liberals which were communist sympathizers, etc. And similar, although in a weaker way, this type of uh, connecting the, the current <coughs> political problem with the issue of dealing with the communist past was, the, uh, was with Kaczynski. And because it's such an intractable and such a difficult and painful issue, uh, the, and none of it happened in Romania, none at all, uh, that's why these, these two circumstances, uh, situations are, are quite incomparable. Allow me also to address the question of what should, in a sense, trigger burdens of justification. Uh, three ideas. Um, at a very abstract philosophical level, you might say that whatever exactly the EU is, it has now reached a level of interdependence that actually any deep change in any individual country creates a certain burden of justification. That in a sense, even though you might have problems with the all effective principle in political philosophy in general, in the EU it actually applies, hence that's one trigger. But more specifically, you could think of two forms of inconsistency which could, which could serve as triggers. First of all, if I had seven and a half hours more, I think I could demonstrate that for historical reasons, the EU has actually developed something that is comparable to a kind of pan-European basic structure. That for historical reasons, all countries that transitioned to democracy since the 1970s opted for a particular understanding of democracy doesn't mean that in general, normatively, universally, that's the only model. But if you opted for it and then change, there are reasons to explain yourself. This goes basically back to the, the point that Wojciech just made. If you adopt certain structures, then you remove them. Prima facie, there's a question of why you're doing that. That's one inconsistency. Second of all, uh, you might face the following inconsistency, and that's basically the Hungarian case again. If you then justify what you do, and basically everybody always always justifies anyway. I mean, nobody does sort of changes of this sort in a sort of mute fashion. Everybody has a reason that they advance. If these reasons turn out to be internally contradictory, there's a particular problem. So in the Hungarian case, sometimes you hear the argument that, yes, we're removing certain institutions or weakening them, but we're doing so in the name of democracy. And then exactly the UK argument is brought in. Parliamentary democracy, strong parliamentary democracy, sovereignty even, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly legitimate understanding of democracy in a, in, in a European context. But then the question is, of course, all right, so if that is your ideal, why are you entrenching very specific partisan preferences in a constitution at the same time, such that a future parliament, you know, not only cannot make a man into a woman, well, of course, that is possible, but uh, that you cannot basically change a tax regime, pension regime, and so on and so forth. Now, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, this process of deliberation, supranational deliberation, if you like, will have a particular outcome, but that's a clear case where you could say, look, you really ought to explain yourself more. You need to justify more what you're doing because what you are doing or what you're saying is inconsistent. So, very good. I don't think we've settled uh, the issues, but we've got a, an understanding of a range of... <coughs> a range of answers, uh, a range of understandings, both with regard to uh, what exactly is going wrong, how to best conceptualize what is going wrong, and also a couple of explanations uh, that were a couple of hypotheses uh, what was going on that I'm not going to uh, even try to summarize here now. Uh, but I'd like to move us to move on uh, and focus on the remedies part yet. And I know there were some um, uh, who already wanted, uh, s uh, indicated that they wanted to talk about remedies, but now is also the time to raise your hands independently of that. 
so that I can uh, take a list. Okay, we start. Chris. So at the risk of making myself even more unpopular. Um, <laughs> So, so if one of the problems that we've identified is one of constitutional culture, and that seemed to be you know, one of the themes that's going on, uh, then this becomes really quite important, doesn't it, in terms of the potential remedy, and in particular addressing Lex's uh, question about well, whether it should be political or judicial. Um, and if the problem is one of constitutional structure, one of constitutional culture, it seems to me even more the case that one would not want to put that into <coughs> the area of the courts. Um, I mean, not least because if the legitimacy of the court is one of, as it were, adjudicating on rules, the more you talk about constitutional culture, the less rule bound and the more, as was pointed out, discretionary, the more judgment that that involves. So that's one area, I think, why one would want to head off a judicial implementation of any reasons for intervention, or any basis for intervention. The other is, and I think it's probably even more important, that the European Court of Human Rights is increasingly finding it difficult to get its judgments implemented. There are now non-implemented judgments <laughs> in three or four major countries, uh, and in some of those, there seems no <coughs> prospect that they will be implemented. That is beginning to lead to a potential illegitimacy crisis for the court. I don't think you want to encourage that. So if not the court, then who? And we come back to the European Union. It seems to be in terms of Article 7. Article 7 is not going to be Right. Article 7 has been consistently identified as a nuclear option by the commissioner, by people informally in the commission. That's not going to be used, I think, in any sustained way. If it's not that, and you want something more than simply intergovernmentalism in terms of diplomatic pressure, then the crucial question becomes, what else? In that context, it seems to me that one of the issues then becomes um, the, not only the problem about the increasing uh, institutionalization outside um, the political domain, but a much more central question, I think, of whether you think constitutionalism is the way forward at all on this. And so far, there seems to be a general consensus that it's constitutionalism that we want to be promoting. And I'm not sure it is. It seems to me that the crucial question may well be one of simple politics, of how to create within the European Union sufficient incentives, political incentives, for Hungary or whatever to come back into line. In terms of self-interest, rather than building a, a large argument in terms of constitutionalism, which I think is going to lead to a lot more controversy and a lot, more, a lot easier escape for countries like Hungary, than simply um, creation of political incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, very briefly, because I have to go to the extent. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to comment this discussion into this very crease. I, I, I cannot do that. I just believe that there is a different constitutional culture on the continent, meaning Germany, France, and Italy, and a different one in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm that I cannot comment on that. I have two skeptical remarks about remedies. One is that I, from the point of view of <coughs> the constitutional theorist, I totally agree with Lech remarks about what constitution has to say and how constitutional amendment can be enforced. But has to be studied. Up to my knowledge, we have three examples of constitutional courts and nullifying constitutional amendments. One is not very useful for us, it's Turkey, not the epitome of a liberal democracy. So let's study it and doing that, but it's not to follow the example. The second one, Sujit can give you a lecture on that, is India. So I stopped speaking about that. Third, there are courts which use some warning mm -hmm. in obiter dictum. Mm -hmm. The Italian Constitutional Court somehow 
in their own way the Bundesverfassungsgericht. Mm -hmm. But it may be a more bar than I'm to bar. Mm -hmm. As uh, Steve was saying, the constitution, of course, do not have the equivalent of Fox News, which is very bad. They should, but they do not have it. So I'm collecting how many of them. Of the daily mail. I'm not very optimistic. <laughs> Second, I also agree essentially with Steve about what Europe can do. Europe cannot do much, but someone can do something, which is a bit more important than the European Got Union. Do you remember the old Harry Kissinger asking for a telephone number? Oh, yeah. Now we have it. Merkel. Is the <laughs> German <laughs> Kanzler. Yes, yes, yes. You, everybody knows now in the world, everybody who knows um, any, something about politics. Yeah that the person who matters is the, the German government. I mean, now it's Angela Merkel, maybe another person, apparently not in the future. So Germany meaning the economic power of Germany. Mm -hmm. And it seems that underground, Germany has been putting pressure on the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the recent days, it seems that Orban stepped a little bit back but you cannot make a campaign because a campaign produces the strong nationalists, especially in the case of Hungary. There is a long-standing tradition of the betrayal of the Trianon Treaty and all these Hungarians in Slovenia and Serbia. So Europe cannot make a campaign. We saw that already with uh, uh, Austria, but we don't have a strong European Union, but we have a very strong Germany. So that may be good or bad, we will see in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I cannot play the next year. He speaks and he goes. He is going to make a call. He's going to call Merkel for us, OK? <laughs> But I want to ask you a question about the classification between pathologies and remedies that you set out on the second page of your synopsis. So if I understand, there's two basic kinds of illegitimate constitutional amendments that you want to identify, and then two kinds of remedies that you want to um, uh, highlight. Now, I want to ask about the first remedy, about the non-amendment remedy, and the kinds of cases to which it can be applied. So I take it that the non-amendment remedy can be applied to either of the pathologies that you mentioned. And those pathologies are um, this entrenchment problem where the legislature seems to usurp the powers of a future legislature, or the nullification problem in which a statute that has been overturned by the courts reappears as a constitutional amendment. But what I wonder is whether there's a further kind of pathology that um, we would actually have to take account of when we talk about remedies. And that is, couldn't we have an instance of a constitutional amendment um, in which the amendment isn't trying to resurrect a law that the court has struck down. Rather, the amendment simply dismantles some feature of the constitutional order and is, as you put it then, substantively problematic. So suppose it effaces judicial review or the rule of law or fundamental rights, some pillar of the constitutional order. Then we might have a case where there's um, uh, what you might call a substantially problematic constitutional amendment, but not one in which a, a law that has been struck down is now being resurrected to an amendment. Do we want to apply non-amendment to that kind of case? So because it was a direct question to Lech, I think we start with Lech again, but then we move to Jan and move the other way. Yeah, so two, two remarks. One, uh, well, but this is more or less uh, this uh, already relatively well-established concept of, of basic structure. And this is something we already know. Well, Pasquale says that only three constitutional courts, or two constitutional courts, as a matter of fact. Uh, but this uh, ammo is already there. And uh, in case uh, of something, uh, say, of a serious crisis, I think many constitutional courts could now resort to this uh, uh, intellectual operation saying uh, there is something like basic structure of the Constitution if you dismantling judicial review 
as such, uh, this uh, is an invasion uh, into the basic structure. The problem with Hungary is uh, that I think most of these constitutional amendments they are not uh, uh, serious enough uh, to be regarded as intervening into basic structure. But nevertheless, there is something wrong with them. And this is a new phenomenon. This is something uh, which uh, we've never had, I think, at least uh, within uh, countries trying to be democratic. We've never had before uh, in, such a, in, in such a dimension. And that's why I still think it's necessary to try to describe it using some traditional categories, but transposing these categories to some, uh, to some, new, uh, to some new situations. Uh, one short remark about uh, the uh, options, because I, I also have my class to teach very, very soon. Yes, I agree. There is this nuclear option also in the Council of Europe. We may kick uh, out uh, uh, Hungary from the Council of Europe, but, <coughs> but then what then? Hungary will not disappear. So, so, so it's, it's, it will be more or less the same problem. Uh, and so, Azerbaijan is still Yeah, in. and Azerbaijan is still, but Azerbaijan behaves. Uh, uh, and uh, calling Angela Merkel, of course, it's a very good idea. Uh, but the problem is uh, that Angela has other problems. <laughs> and then uh, if we uh, put the problem of democracy in Hungary uh, in balance uh, with the uh, economic problems of Europe, of these all countries who are now co constantly trying to ruin the system, then uh, I don't think Angela is uh, dreaming about Hungarian problems. She has other problems. And then uh, if all these mechanisms of interventions are going to be used in one way or another, then uh, in other countries, maybe the primary addresses. And at the same time, it's well known to all these uh, countries who uh, decide what to do within the European Union. It's very clear that if some precedence will be, precedent will be established uh, in regard to, to Hungary, OK, it doesn't cost anything. So you can, the, the European Union can do anything. But then uh, it could be valid uh, for other situations, much more serious. Uh, and this is something which probably those countries who run the European Union would never, would never allow. So I don't think we have too many nuclear options. I don't think we have too many uh, political options. Uh, what we must try to find uh, is uh, at least uh, something uh, that may not function in Hungary. And sooner or later, this problem probably will be solved just by the passage of time. But something that uh, could be useful for analyzing other situations, other countries, other processes, simply by telling what is wrong, what should be avoided in the future, what kind of remedies and what, right, what kind of concepts may be useful for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So two points. Um, first of all, I don't think we can conclude on the basis of empirical evidence that the EU is powerless in these situations. I think what we can conclude is that matters are highly contingent. So the reason why the current Hungarian government didn't always go all the way and sometimes really did pull back substantively is due to factors such as commissioner rating taking a very strong interest in these matters, the German and the Austrian press writing a lot about these matters, all kinds of things which, you know, were important but out of which we can't build any kind of general system or rule of law mechanism and so on. But we shouldn't conclude that, oh, the EU has no role to play. Even in the case of Austria 2000, where it's completely agreed conventional wisdom that it was some huge disaster, well, actually not the EU, but the other 14 EU countries at that point did, I wouldn't be so sure. We simply do not know what would have happened in the absence of these sanctions. So I don't think the empirical case is that, is that clear. Second point, in response to what Chris was saying. So in theory, in general, it's, it's perfectly logical to say that if the problem is ultimately political, we ought to look for a political solution. Question is, what exactly does political mean in this context? All the proposals on the table about something political ultimately come down to something like a principle of peer review. Peer review by other member states or even peer review within the party families. You know, calling, uh, calling Merkel basically means having her tell Orban, look, if you want to be part of the EPP, you can't cross certain boundaries. Otherwise, we're going to take some symbolic uh, action mm. against you. But the trouble with peer review is obviously, as we've, and on this we have strong empirical evidence, 
that everybody thinks, you know, if I pee against you, you're going to pee against me. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, that we actually do know. So even though there is a mismatch between a political problem and then a remedy that looks like, in, in the case of my proposal, you know, the, the typical panel of wise men and women, you know, decreeing on what constitutionalism is, I don't see anything beyond that on the table right now that would, would have a possible effect. At the same time, saying to a country, look, if you don't observe certain limits, you de facto are going to lose a lot of money, seems to me is not a trivial incentive to put in front of a government. Mm -hmm. check. Okay, well, well, two points. Uh, one worry which I have about the conclusions which are normally being drawn from uh, the Hungarian crisis uh, that once again we'll end up with some sort of idealizing of constitutional courts and presenting them as the only good guys in the sort of ocean of uh, populist uh, demagogues, etc. And I simply think that it is not true. Uh, <coughs> specifically uh, specifically uh, referring to what Jacob said about a constitutional, about a constitutional amendment overruling, overriding a constitutional court's decisions. In principle, there is nothing particularly wrong about it. You know, we may don't like, we may dislike that particular right. decision which is being overridden. Right. But we know in the history of judicial review that very often it led to very <laughs> positive results. When the uh, French parliament has adopted a constitutional amendment about equality of genders in the elections as a way of overriding Conseil Constitutionnel, which had invalidated a, a proposed uh, law then, everyone applauded it. So somehow it may be seen as precisely the sort of, I don't know, constitutional dialogue, conversation, etc., which, uh, which is a concept originating, Jacob, from your country, rather than some sort of, you know, uh, aberration or, or, or pathology of the system. So uh, somehow focusing on those uh, immaculate constitutional courts, uh, which we should, the power of which we should protect uh, by all means, uh, is, is, is just a wrong, a wrong conclusion for me. Uh, and the second point about the remedies. Yes, I, I may well be the, the last living defender of Article 7, <laughs> but I don't see what's, what's irrational about it. It is not a nuclear option. There's no, if anything, it's a conventional weapon. No, it's, uh, 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 let's, let's remember that precisely the first, it, it was enhanced in Nice Treaty precisely for situations such as in Hungary and as a result of the, uh, of the Austrian debacle. It's not, uh, and I do not necessarily accept uh, Jan Werner's characterization that Article 7 is not about intervention, it's about isolating. No, it's not. You know, the first part gives rise to some sort of reasoned discussions about what went wrong. After all, before making, now I'm quoting Article 7, Section 1, before making such a determination, that is determination about clear risk of serious breach, the council shall hear the member state in question, may address recommendations to it, etc., etc. There is a room for dialogue. As far as triggering it, uh, it is, I think, perfectly practicable, you know, because it may be triggered by the European Parliament. So we, European citizens, may press our MEPs, you know, to actually uh, move in this direction. And then it's decided by majority of four fifths of its of members of the Council. So we, citizens of European states, may press our government on taking this stand in the Council. Of course, if we keep repeating. It is not going to be used, it is not going to be used, it is not going to be used, then obviously it will become some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but I see absolutely no reasons why this particular device, which has been introduced into the treaties precisely to deal in a differentiated way, look at the difference between section one and section two, which are not steps in the one process, one, but which are two different processes. Why it shouldn't be used, and we say, okay, because it wasn't used so far, it's not going to be used, let's think about a different institution. I don't accept that approach, if you like, to institutional design. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah, so I actually agree with what's on Article 7. I think Article 7 is the perfect mechanism for this situation. I think it's designed for this, and I'm always annoyed that it's considered the nuclear option. Um, but I want to actually say something about the law politics um, dis discussion that was going on. Um, partly, I, you know, I'm a law professor in my soul, so I find politics permanently depressing, and I always love the courts. Um, this is partly hardwired into, you know, my specialization and the way I think about things. But I think actually when you look at what's happened so far in Europe, there are also reasons to believe that this needs 
a solution more legal than political. Um, so originally, when Orban first started, um, the European People's Party rallied behind him, as in fact the socialists rallied behind Ponta, you know, in the early phase of the Romanian crisis. The first reaction of parties was to, to defend their own without being able to inquire very much into what they were doing. And some of this is that despite all the, you know, despite the fact that the translation service is the largest piece of the EU, all this stuff is happening in languages that most people don't read. And so, and Orban has gotten as far as he has, and Ponta has done some as well, by saying something different in the languages people understand than in the languages they normally operate in. And that's a, it takes a long time to get behind the language problem, and that's been a big chunk of it. Um, and so I don't think the political parties have behaved very well um, in general with Orban until we actually got last summer to this Tavares report. And one of the interesting things about the Tavares report, and many of you wrote about this in your reaction paper, so I think you've, you've read it, this, this very strong European um, parliamentary report, was that they could only really bring it to the floor if they promised that the final vote would be a voice vote and not on the record. Mm. And that's how they were able to spring half the EPP loose from defending Orban. Um, and so what kind of politics is that when people don't stand behind their votes? It's better than not having it, but it wasn't ideal. So, so my thought about this is that, um, you know, I don't know if, if the partisan institutions of the EU um, are really going to rise to the occasion. And, and Merkel has actually, um, you know, Merkel's genius, right, is that she never says anything. And she, everything is, you know, tentacles behind the scenes. And there are lots of reasons to believe that she's been very active in trying to isolate Orban and to convey that she's with the European institutions if they want to sanction him. And I, I believe that. I don't have a direct line to Merkel, but she's not in Orban's camp. She hasn't appeared publicly with him. She has done a lot of things which indicate her non-approval in her Merkelian kind of way. Um, but I think that actually, and looking forward, I mean, a lot of the remedies that we're talking about are remedies that would actually require treaty reform in Europe. And think about the processes of treaty reform, which require unanimous votes of the member states. Hungary can veto. <laughs> so can Romania, any state that thinks of themselves in the crosshairs of anything that requires treaty change can veto and bring their Eurosceptical partners along with them, because any treaty change is going to empower the EU. So I think we actually have to think very concretely about working within the remedies we have. I think Article 7 is serious, and I wish that it weren't being talked about as the nuclear option. But the other thing, and I, I drowned some of you in paper last night um, as, as I was thinking about what everyone else was saying, I think there's one other possible remedy here. Um, and that is uh, that the, the main way of garden variety EU law enforcement has been the infringement action. But infringement actions, as all of you who have studied EU law know, are usually really boring and technical and picky. You know, I mean, and, and they're usually brought on extremely specific aspects of national law. Um, what I've been proposing and what I think is now getting a little bit of uptake uh, in the Commission is this idea that what the Commission should do with cases like Hungary, where it's not just one thing they're doing, it's, it's again this checklist mentality of the they're doing this the wrong thing and that one wrong thing. The problem in Hungary is that they're doing a bunch of things together. And it's the systemic quality of it that's causing the problem. So what I think the EU can do um, is to actually, that the Commission, I think, has within its existing powers the capacity to take a series of things that are individually and especially collectively an infringement of EU law, bundle them together under the rubric of Article 2, um, which is the values article of the Treaty of the European Union, protecting democracy, rule of law, uh, and uh, human rights, bundle it under a more general argument, and send it to the ECJ for review. Now, I know Chris doesn't like judicial review, but hear me out on this. There are a couple of advantages of this. One is that all the other sanctions in the EU um, firmament are multi-institutional sanctions. So when, when, uh, when uh, the German foreign minister with three other foreign ministers wrote to the commission and said, we think you should just cut Hungary's funds, or they cut the funds of rogue states, they were also thinking about Romania at that time, that's really, I think, against the spirit of the treaties, to have one institution with that kind of sanctioning power. <coughs> it needs confirmation from another institution. And if you look at the other institutions from which this could get confirmation, I think this is actually where the ECJ can confirm what will be, in part, a political judgment, but needs a legal confirmation um, that there is a sort of serious infringement of the legal obligations of the state under the treaties. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that if, by, by bundling a series of actions and sending them to the Court of Justice, one of the things that does is it gives the Court of Justice the capacity to see 
the whole thing a country is doing. Now, one of the differences in the, or the, ECJ, the ECHR uh, operates in panels where every panel sees every case from that particular country. So the judges get a very good picture of the overall state of affairs in the countries that are in their panel. At the ECJ, when an infringement action goes in, it gets randomly assigned. So these different cases that have involved Hungary have gone to this panel, that panel, the other panel, and people I know who work at the court tell me no one has a picture of the whole because of the way these small actions get divided up across. If you bundle them together, that means one set of judges will see the whole thing, which I think actually the ECJ would prefer, and I think the commission would really benefit from having judges see it. If the ECJ agrees not only on the individual infringements, but that there is an Article II infringement or some more systemic generic infringement, then what that would mean is that the, what it would mean to comply with a judgment of the court would have to be systemic and not so picky. So one of the things the Orban government has been able to do is to take all the action, all the ju adverse judgments, and simply modify the little thing that was objected to, which changes nothing in the system. And this would mean that compliance would have to focus systemically. Finally, very quickly, um, if there is a failure of compliance um, and the commission goes back to the ECJ for a, in an in a Article 260 proceeding to get a fine levied, then one of the things I think the ECJ should be, that, the, that the commission should be able to do is to take a fine levied by the ECJ out of the funds that the EU would pay to the country, okay, which is a way of leveraging hitting those funds, which is what these foreign ministers have ar already advocated, but tying it to a more systemic legal procedure. And so let's hope. That's, that's one of the things I think the Commission can do within its mandate now. Okay. Now, um, uh, I know there are a number of uh, people <coughs> here who have to leave at the very latest shortly before four, so, but I do want to have a very quick final round. So I'd ask you to be short. Then we'll have a very short last comment from our panelists. David Dyson-Hauser. Mm -hmm. so, I, I think sorry, I have a bit of a cold. That there was a deep theoretical challenge that Chris posed that hasn't yet been answered. So th there's a mess now. And we're looking at the moment for practical remedies to get us out of this mm -hmm. mess or get them out of their mess. So I, I thought part of what Chris was saying is that we're in the mess, or they're in the mess, partly because we, they went down this constitutional path. So we get these constitutionally entrenched structures. Only people have a vision that uh, politics can be uh, constrained by structures. So you get the other sorts of power, they want to tear down those uh, structures and put in place uh, new structures. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, I don't agree with this, but I thought this was part of uh, Chris's objection that he thought might be making him unpopular, was it would have been better to do without constitution than altogether. Let these <laughs> countries develop uh, in a kind of incremental way as uh, the United Kingdom developed over a couple of centuries and let a culture develop. You cannot create a culture by putting in place a new constitution. So I, I think there's a, a really interesting challenge here that hasn't yet been uh, answered. Uh, thank you. Let me start with my conclusion. I tend to agree with Stephen's uh, point that there is no remedy. Uh, neither uh, internal nor, nor uh, external remedy. Uh, Concerning the internal one, uh, I don't think that constitutional amendment and review of constitutional amendment works anymore, uh, uh, since the court is bad. So it's, it's over. Uh, uh, concerning the, the external remedy, I, I agree with, with Wojciech that, that Article 7 is not a nuclear option. Therefore, I don't think that for Orban it, it matters. Uh, even if it, it would be Article 7 uh, sanction. Uh, concerning concerning the, the uh, infringement act actions of, of Kim, I, I have the same, same feeling that Orban has some alternatives, mm -hmm. as well as alternatives to, to Germany, to German support. He has some alternative funding for Hungary. So therefore, these remedies, I don't think Well, then we just uh, go around one more time, starting with Jan. Just uh, I don't think there was any particular question to me, so uh, I don't no want to take up more. No big final word. <coughs> no, I, I, other than to warn against um, sliding. Well, actually, no, two points. Now that you, now that you, you know, or three points. No, um, no, just just two things very briefly. Since we were invited to talk about Hungary and Romania, 
uh, maybe it's simply worth reminding ourselves that in, in the end we mostly talked about Hungary. Mm. But whatever we come up with, in a sense, would also have to fit the Romanian situation, where the most dis distinctive characteristic was that everything happened extremely quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So infringement, uh, etc., et it's uh, great ideas, but it wouldn't possibly fit that case. You would have had to be able to say something within about 10 days um, for potentially irreversible changes to take place. Yeah. So that, I think, is worth bearing in mind. Um, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution in, in, in these questions, but we, we have, in a sense, again, we have now enough empirical evidence to say that, look, now we know that certain things can happen. So, you know, we, we shouldn't be in denial about the fact that, you know, we, people will try this maybe again, and then we have something, we have to have something ready that can't just be, oh, but we concluded from Hungary that it had to be like, had to be like this. Second point, just very briefly, uh, I don't think we should be quite so defeatist and say that, oh, well, we have to give these countries a couple more centuries to catch up with the UK-style constitutional culture and so on and so forth. Um, it's very tempting, of course, to now go into a kind of reverse determinism and just as much as people put all their hope into new constitutionalism about 15 years ago, now, in a sense, we do the opposite. We blame the people. We blame the people for not having gotten the message, for being still illiberal, etc., etc., when in fact the outcomes are highly contingent. I mean, as Kim pointed out at the very beginning, with a different electoral law in Hungary, without quite so severe a financial crisis, without a prime minister uh, admitting on, on the record, well, not, fit, not, not intentionally, but de facto, <laughs> that he'd been lying to the electorate, without these things, we might not be having this discussion at all. So let's not jump to the conclusion that, oh, it was all culturally <coughs> predetermined, just as much as we before had a different determinism about how constitution was going to fit everyone and solve all problems forever. Lech, you're next. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have my class in 10 minutes, so just mm -hmm. uh, two remarks. Uh, one, I still think that David may be more right uh, than uh, it uh, appears uh, on the uh, first side, because uh, apparently in many East European countries, there is a problem with uh, remaining within a traditional understanding of constitutionalism uh, as elaborated in Western Europe. Now, what does it mean? I do not know. But does it mean uh, that uh, East European countries should be somehow forced uh, to join uh, those uh, well-established uh, uh, patterns of constitutionalism? Perhaps, but also the idea that uh, still most nations are wise enough to somehow uh, solve their problems uh, by themselves is not so uh, completely out, out of place. Uh, still, Orban today has a quite significant support uh, of uh, the people, and this also should not be uh, completely neglected. Uh, this is not the case of Nazi Germany. This is a case uh, of, 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 of legitimate uh, support of the people of, uh, of, of, of Hungary. So maybe the not completely unreasonable uh, diagnosis or cure is simply to wait uh, until the electorate will understand that it is not the best idea. And in many countries, uh, such a... Uh, realization arrived sooner or later and the problem was solved. Now, discussing constitutional amendments or other things like that, of course it, not, if it will not <coughs> solve the Hungarian problem now, but we may simply capitalize on some concepts uh, uh, and uh, ideas uh, which may be useful in the future if they enter into the vocabulary of, of constitutional law. And I think from this, uh, say, uh, laboratory perspective, uh, this is a very attractive opportunity because we may elaborate something new and who knows when it could be useful and, uh, and to where. Okay, uh, two points. Uh, is there a remedy? I mentioned earlier an external remedy, but of course the most important remedy is internal. And yes, there is a remedy. The same remedy as was uh, used against the Kaczynski government in 2007 and it's <coughs> called the national election. Huh. And that's the, the only remedy we can think of. And even allowing for all the, if you like, uh, defects of democracy uh, caused by Orban government, even for everything that Kim has so eloquently 
demonstrated, the gerrymandering, the entrenchment effects, etc., it is still possible to vote the Orban government out of office. And if the Hungarians decide not to, well, that's what democracy we is about. To the, the, there, there is a very strong remedy there. And the second point is about the constitution. I, I would like, and, and, and the points made by, by David, I still believe that one of the contributing reasons of the consti constitutional crisis in Hungary is that, the, that when the Orban for the second time took office, the constitutional structure in Hungary was a mess. You know, it was some sort of patchwork of the old so-called communist uh, constitution with plenty of amendments because it was very easy to amend the constitution and lots of jurisprudence of the constitutional court. It was a mess, at least from the point of view, if you like, of civil law type of uh, mentality, uh, which likes to have a comprehensive and consistent constitutional text, Hungary was a mess. And in particular, from the symbolic point of view, there was never a constitutional, if you like, separation from the old system, from the from some sort of symbolic step breaking with the past. And that is why it was so easy for Orban to bring about this new constitution, because it was easy to convince that somehow all the governments in Hungary preceding him had some sort of be, have bad conscience and haven't done proper things about changing the constitution. So from that point of view, I really do not agree with perhaps the best text that I've read about the constitutional if you like, uh, issues in, in, in Hungary, and that is an introduction by Janos Kisch to, mm -hmm. to this book, A Constitution for the Divided Nation. But on this thing, I think he's not, uh, he, he's not correct. Constitution, uh, Hungary, before Orban, didn't have a good constitution, and that contributed to the mess. The last word is yours, Kim. Oh, goodness. Well, <clears throat> so first of all, I always want to say in these contexts, be careful what you wish for, because now that everyone's pumped up, not everyone, not Wojtek and not Chris, and maybe not David, uh, to pumped up to think, you know, what we really need is the Constitutional Court defending Hungary. As Gabor pointed out, the court is now packed with Orban loyalists, so it will soon start issuing decisions that will start defending all of this. So, and this will be true, and same was true with the election, that the election law now so tilts the playing field toward this party that it, it happens to be the most popular party in the country, but if it weren't, it would still win under these rules. And so really a lot is in place that will make the usual corrective mechanisms very hard to very hard to say. But let me say something that weirdly will agree with the thrust of what I think Chris and David and the you know the sort of English constitutionalists in the room uh, want to say. And that is that I'm actually spending um, this year writing a book on the Holy Crown of St. Stephen which is the crown given by the, first, uh, by, the, by the Pope to the first Christian king of Hungary, Stephen, in the year 1000, um, which has formed the basis of constitutional law in Hungary for more than a thousand years, as its advocates say. Um, and one of the interesting things about this crown um, is that uh, actually there is a fair amount of interesting medieval stuff that um, shows that this crown actually stands for an English-style constitutionalism, at least in the Middle Ages. And there was, a, there was a flurry of books in the late 19th century about the parallels between British and Hungarian constitutional history, right? So I'm actually working on an entirely different path of trying to change this, which is to try to resuscitate historic constitutional traditions in Hungary, in which there's this thing called the Arambula. Sounds like the Magna Carta. It reads even better with age. Um, that's only seven years uh, uh, older than the, or newer than the Magna Carta. Um, there's a codification, a, a 17th, 16th century codification of Hungarian law in which sovereignty rests in the crown, never passes to the king. There's never a theoretical basis for absolutism in traditional Hungarian constitutional theory. The king always governs under the crown and therefore under the rule of law. I could go on and on and on. There's a whole book on this. But the basic thing to say is that another resource that can be used are the historical traditions of a country that, like Hungary, has really had a very long and proud legal tradition. Great. Thank you very much.